Happy Sabbath, Church. Welcome this morning. A special welcome to our mothers and all of our visitors. We're so glad to have you. A special thanks again uh, to everybody who helped put together this morning's Mother's Day breakfast. We really wanted our mothers to feel loved and honored. And uh, I don't know, I really enjoy it. Who loves a good breakfast? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Uh, This is not the last we'll do. We'll do one on Father's Day and then Christmas again. I feel weird announcing something that's coming in December, but it's coming, right? (laughs) The year is flying so fast. Um, This morning, we're continuing in the book of Acts as we have been, and we're looking at today the idea of growing pains. And now that I am a father of three, I am acutely aware of growing pains. (laughs) Not only was my wife being pregnant and had kids three times, but just watching my kids grow. I feel like with Harry, every year I have to buy him a new pair of school shoes, a new pair of runners, a new pair of shirts, a new pair of trousers. And I'm just like, do I have to do this with Max and Macy? Like... Growing pains are real, and they come with financial costs, they come with time costs. And I think, you know, whether you're a parent or not, we all deal with growing pains, right? Our church, praise God, is going through some growing pains, yeah? Uh, This is not the point of the sermon today, uh, what I'm about to show you, but up on the screen for a moment, we have devised a survey Because we're going through growing pains, we are looking to build. I promised you last week that we'd have a survey ready. Take a photo of this. We'll put the details in the newsletter. But here is a link to a survey. We'd love our members and regular visitors to fill it out. We'd love to know your thoughts on what do we need as a community that's going through growing pains. A community that is growing, we want to be effective in reaching not only our growing community, but the community outside of our walls. So bookmark that, take a screenshot, and um, fill it out later. Uh, We'll put this in the newsletter, we'll put it in the announcements again next week. But I just wanted to bring that to your awareness. We'd love to get to know what's going on. Speaking of growing pains as well, a, a, a neglected area of our church has been our expanding youth group. And as of next week, we are going to be kicking off a youth class with um, uh, Matthew over there. I want to call you pastor. You're on your way to being a pastor. Matthew over there, I'm going to give him a formal introduction one day. We missed the boat a few weeks back, but we'll be starting a new class. So if you're in that year 12-ish age, and above, we're going to start a class just for you. It's all about growing. We want to accommodate the needs of our community. Now, growing pains is a real issue for churches, as I've mentioned. And the passage that Daniel read so well is a passage that deals with growing pains. Any church should hope to have this kind of a problem. A problem, what do we do? We're expanding. I mean, When I left to go to Avondale, I don't want to think how long ago that was. That was 2007. Casey Church, my home church, which was Dandenong Church, we were going through growing pains. And we were like, we cannot stay here. We were putting chairs in the foyer. We were sometimes using the church hall as an overflow. And we had to do something about it. Because if you don't address the growing pains, often it can lead to negativity. And so I want to unpack what does it mean to work through the issues that come about as we start to grow as a community. For context, we're reading in Acts, as you know, and what we've just read, what Daniel read for us, takes place about three to five years after Pentecost. We saw last week together at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fills the disciples and it comes over them in power and they're they're so excited to share what God has done through Jesus. The church grows to some 3,000 men, not including women and children. There's this incredible growth and the church will continue to grow over the next few years, right? Right? I want to read to you in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, Now in these days, 
when the disciples were increasing in number. So we, we, we recognize there, there's this growth. And the church, I said to you, began, begins with about 3,000 people. Scholars believe in three to five years, the church in Jerusalem has now grown to at least, at least 30,000 people. Wouldn't that be great growth for the Packenham Church? I don't even know if there's 30,000 people around here. Like, that's pretty crazy, right? 30,000 people. Now, there's a whole lot of reasons why this growth has happened, okay? But what we seem to, the, what Luke wants you to realize, this growth, if we read Scripture and we read between the lines, I think he wants us to, to see that this is coming about as a result of preaching the Word, of proclaiming the good news of Jesus, and prayer. These two things in particular. Now, there's a lot of important things that are happening in this community, but in particular, proclaiming the good news of Jesus, preaching, and prayer are the things that he wants to draw our attention of. Let's just give a summary, just to, to illustrate this point, right? And the summary is there for all of us who've heard and for those of us who haven't been here for the last few weeks. Okay, before Jesus would uh, go back to heaven, right? He spends 40 days uh, talking to the disciples, teaching that they are to be his witness. He commissions them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, to speak the gospel, okay? Uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, we see the disciples devote themselves to prayer, to receive the power of the Holy Spirit, to have power to make these proclamations. In Acts chapter 2, we see the Spirit empowers the disciples to speak the good news of Jesus. They preach, Peter preaches, and we looked a little bit of his sermon last week. We see in Acts chapter 2 verse 42 that the new disciples all devoted themselves, these 3,000 people devoted themselves to prayer. Peter will, and we're going to look at these stories, Peter will preach in chapter 3. The new church will pray during a time of persecution for boldness in the face of persecution to keep proclaiming in chapter 4. And we'll also see that they were beaten for the preaching that they were doing. Proclaiming the name of Jesus and prayer friends go hand in hand. And if I'm honest with you, it's not something that's always gone hand in hand for this pastor. There have been far too many times where I've just been like, yeah, I've got the goods, I know what I'm doing, and I've put so much effort into what I'm doing, I forget to invite God into what He needs to be doing. And how many of us go through life wanting to be an effective witness to our friends, to our families, to our work colleagues, we need the boldness, we need to say the right words, but we forget to pray about it. Luke wants you to see that it is so important. If you are going to see growth, there needs to be prayer and proclamation hand in hand. I found this, one of the founders of the Adventist church, not Ellen White, uh, he had this to say as a pastor, and he said he, he's critiquing ministers in the 1800s. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is so intense. But he said... We are seeing problems because far too few pastors are spending at least four hours on their knees a day in prayer. <laughs> four hours a day. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. I was like reading. I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe like a good hour. He's like, it, no, not enough of us are spending four hours on our knees. Isn't that incredible? I mean, the Adventist church, when it started, it, it made some big progress in the early days. And I 110% believe that proclamation and prayer went hand in hand. You see where this church moved in so short amount of time. And I have no doubt that God was working through the prayers of his people, working through their ability to proclaim. So great things happen when we get on our knees. God will step into our lives and we can find that boldness. And we'll look at more of those stories in the weeks to come. 
The question is, they're praying for this power, but what, what does that power look like? Well, Romans 1.16 says, Paul says this, We must not be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. This is why we pray, to have that boldness to share this power in the lives of people around us. Now, here's the thing. I really believe that this church was praying. They were boldly sharing. And when these two things happen in conjunction, we will see growth. Amen? I want to encourage you to come to our, our, our prayer meeting. It's really good. I really enjoy it. It's, and has got us reading this book on all these great principles. Please come along. It's really good. Now, here's the thing. I really believe that when we start to do these things, it really bugs Satan, right? I don't think he enjoys it when we realize that all we need to do is to tap into the man upstairs. I mean, in Acts, and we haven't looked at all these stories, what we'll see is that he is going to try and derail this early church through persecution, through inviting sin to take root in the community, but one of his key strategies, as we're going through these growing pains, is like, all right, sin was an issue, but they've dealt with that, and we'll look at that story, and persecution was an issue, but they actually only got on their knees even harder. You know what? I'm going to come into this community, and I'm going to introduce some grumbling. Who loves a good grumble? Anybody? I love a good grumble. <laughs> Aussies like to, to point at the palms and say they love a good wind, but I've met a few Aussies who love a good wind, amen? No one said amen to that. <laughs> All right? So grumbling is a real issue of the church, but Satan, I think it's a real tool that he tries to use. And as we go through this message, I just want you to reflect on the role and the place grumbling has in your own life. So what leads to the grumbling in this story? Well, it's the growth. <laughs> it's the growth that the church is experiencing. Only this week, Harry, I said, Harry, we've got to get your shoes ready for church. And what do you say to me, Harry? I want the black shoes. He wanted the black shoes. Do you know why? Because the white shoes were too tight and they hurt his feet. He was grumbling. A good reason to grumble, right? That when we go through growing pains, we grumble, Okay. And so the church starts to grumble, and there is a direct problem that they're grumbling about, okay? I want to give you a little quote. It's from a guy called James Clear, and he wrote this really good book called Atomic Habits. You should all read it. It talks about the role of habits in our lives. And, and one, of the, one of the big ideas he says is you do not rise to the level of your goals. I'm sure we all have some great goals, want to buy a home, go on a holiday, to the Seychelles in my case, maybe you want to buy a caravan for retirement. But he says, you do not rise to the level of your goals, but you fall to the level of your systems. You do not rise to the level of your goals. We may have some great aspirations, but those aspirations will not be realized if it were not for some good systems. If I want to buy a home, I'm going to have to have a system of saving, of putting away. If I want to tithe, I'm going to have to be intentional about taking the money out before I do anything else, putting it aside. If we have goals, we've got to put some systems in place. And the church doesn't have these systems yet. Now, this is not a Mother's Day sermon, but it does have mothers. And we all love our mothers, right? You should see every hand going up. Right? Don't, don't stare at me. You should see every hand. We love our mothers, right? Our mothers are the best. I was at Heritage College yesterday, and they pulled out all the stops, didn't they, Anna, to show how much they love their mums. It was incredible. They played this video, and there was not a dry eye in the room. I was thinking we should play this here, but... I was like, no, it's going to destroy everyone. It was just showing you the love of a mother and a son. I'm like, oh, I can't speak after this. But guys, uh, look, I'm just getting emotional again. So I'm just putting everyone's eyes on you. But here's the problem. It's got to do with mothers. You see, there are, there are, there are two groups of mothers in the early church. There are Greek mothers 
and there are Jewish mothers. The, 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 the Jewish, I mean, the Greek mothers, the Hellenists, well, the, the, Helen, the Hel, Helen is the short, well, the ancient term for Greek, the Grecians. There's a large Greek community gathered in Jerusalem. As they have these annual Jewish holidays, Greeks from all over the, I mean, Jews from all over the world will come to Jerusalem. And as they're encountering Jesus, a lot of them will choose to stay and be a part of this movement. Now, a lot of these uh, Greek Jews, they've, they've left Israel because of persecution or different things over the years. They come back, their husbands die, and there's nobody to look after them. They don't speak Aramaic like the Hebrews do, and they're kind of isolated. There, are, there is a large Greek community. Archaeologists have found, and I didn't know this until I was preparing for this, but there are literally dozens of Greek synagogues in first century Jerusalem. There was such a large community, such a large immigrant community. Now, the Greek folk are realizing that some of the women in the community, the widows, are not being cared for. There was this daily distribution, the needs were being cared for. We saw at the end of Acts 2 that everybody shared as they had need. Nobody was in need. There's this beautiful kind of synergy. I'm wealthy, I've got money to spare, I'm going to give it to the common fund. We're going to help those who need it. Now you have to remember there is no superannuation. There is no health insurance Okay, there is no retirement fund. There is no sort of system of benevolence that the government gives so I can stay alive. And so the church literally becomes that. And as the church grows, we're told in Scripture that they were neglected. This was not intentional, but as growing pain so often happen, little things ha- you know, sneak through. Harry's shoes start to get tight and his little toe hurts. I need new shoes, Dad. And it's easy to overlook, well, Mom and Dad don't have the money for that right now. We'll buy it in two weeks when we get paid. Do you know what I mean? Like, these things happen, and it's not intentional. It's not meant to hurt anyone, but it happens. So, we need to know that Satan loves to use these growing pains as opportunities to get into the saints' lives, right? Maybe when you look back at your own experience in church, you can see these moments. But Satan loves to bide his time and find the right moment. Think about when Jesus was being persecuted. At the end of his his time in the desert, the Bible tells us, uh, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him, Jesus, until an opportune time. He's waiting for the right time to cause a little bit of strife, maybe in our church, maybe in your family, maybe in your workplace. But Ephesians, through Paul, he's writing to this church in Ephesus, in chapter 4, verse 27, Paul would say, give no opportunity to who? The devil. He's waiting for the opportunity, and Paul says, don't give him that opportunity. So many of us do. I've given him plenty of opportunities. That word opportunity is better probably translated a foothold. Don't let him just climb up into there and just make himself at home, waiting for that perfect moment to cause a little bit of discord and, and, and chaos in our lives. And he finds that perfect foothold moment in the early church. And so the grumbling begins. Now, I've got a fun, you know me, I'm a bit of a Bible nerd, I love a good Greek word. The word for grumbling, if you'd like to say it with me, is gogusmus. (laughs) Gogusmus, okay? Funny word, but that's the word, gogusmus. And it's not just a murmuring, it's a murmuring that keeps on keeping on. It's that leaky tap. We all had the leaky tap at home? For us, the leaky tap at the moment is taking shape in a big, hairy possum that lives in our roof. And I've tried to get rid of it, (laughs) and there are ways you're allowed to and not allowed to, and you can go to jail for some of the ways that you you know. Um, But this possum, 
it found its way into a little shaft on the side of our house. Our pear trees had grown too close to the roof and it found its way onto our roof. It lifted a little spot into our house and um, it's 4 a.m. and we will just hear this, I can't even do it, just this horrible scratching. And you're like, hopefully it'll stop, but it doesn't stop. It keeps on going. And it doesn't, didn't, didn't just happen last night, guys. It happened the night before, and the night before that, and the night before that. This is how long we've been living with this crazy possum. If I look tired more than normal, it's because I don't have three kids. I have three kids and a possum. <laughs> guys, this is what prevailing murmuring, this is what gogusmos looks like. What does gogusmos look like when it comes into our church? with the saints, the people of God who are meant to love each other? What does it look like when it comes into our families? Where there's meant to be, you know, this blood, it's thicker than water, nothing will separate us. Well, we all know that blood is thicker than water, doesn't always work out. Gogusmos can really destroy the most tight-knit of families. I like to think with this idea of murmuring that Satan really likes to do this thing in particular. Um, what he loves to do is, I think he really likes to push, I want you to imagine a bruise, and I know some of our teachers just came from a nice little camp, um, done a bit of hiking in my time, and one day I remember I actually bumped my shin just before I went hiking, and the, sh- the, the bruise on my leg was at the height of my boot. So every time I took a step, the boot would push back on my bruise, yeah? And I, I, I share that to say that I think sometimes in a family, in a tight-knit group, you know, we might accidentally bump into each other's bruises, yeah? There are moments where we might say something, we might do something, and, and it's going to offend and you didn't even know. And Satan loves to take those opportunities to step into our lives. It doesn't matter how well-intentioned we can be, but if we bump into other people's bruises, it could be something that happened in your family, it could have been something that happened at work, we hit that bruise, we get frustrated. And Satan loves to take that opportunity to go, you know what, I don't think that person really cares for you. You know what, I think they care more about themselves than they do. They're all about me. You know what? You're alone out there. You're a lone ranger. Nobody here cares about you. These are the kind of things that we think when people hit our bruises. Sometimes this leads to starting a new church. Sometimes this leads to leaving the family spectacularly. Sometimes this leads to a son not talking to a dad forever. (laughs) We hit each other's bruises. We swallow the bait hook, line, and sinker, and relationships are ruined. Please, speaking from experience, don't swallow the bait. You can see the damage that it does. So what are the bruises in your life that people have accidentally poked and prodded, hopefully unintentionally? Maybe it was your wife. Maybe it was your kids. Maybe it was your boss, maybe it was a neighbor, maybe it was a church member, a pastor, an elder. The problem with this is often we have one of two options. That's not the problem. One option is we can learn to deal with the bruise, figure it out. I've got to do something with my boot because it keeps rubbing against my bruise. I need to figure out a way to resolve this or we can start to complain about the bruise. And we can invite other people into this. And you know what? We then get a situation where it's the Greeks versus the Jews. Pastors love to do this, by the way. (laughs) I don't want to just preach at you. I'm preaching right back at myself. We love to go gusmos. We do it all the time. And it's so easy to just get caught up and accelerated in this, this whinge fest. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? We'll just love to get in there, have a good whinge. I think everybody's favorite person to whinge about was Dan the man. 
If you don't put your hands up, you're all lying. <laughs> we all loved to whinge about Dan, the man with the plan. Well, he has no plan. You know, like, I, man, I did it all the time. It got me through COVID. <laughs> like, and that wasn't a healthy way to get through COVID. But friends, when we let these things fester, they lead to real decay. My dad, up until year 12, used to pay for my health insurance, and he would cover all of the, those sorts of things, and I'd go to the dentist for regular checkups. And then when I went to Avondale, it sort of all fell through the gaps. And um, I didn't go to a dentist for like six years. Uh, <laughs> And then one day in my final year, I'm like, oh my word, I have the worst pain in my mouth. And I just kept ignoring it because I was a cheap university student. I haven't got money to fix this. I'll just take some Panadol. But it, you realize that there's not enough Panadol in the world to fix a bad toothache. And then it gets really good when another toothache appears at the same time. And so poor Ryan, who's on youth allowance to get by, has to figure out, do I pay rent or do I go to the dentist? And I go to the dentist, I get an x-ray, and he's like, wow, you've got like four holes in your teeth. Oh, that's going to cost you, and I'm doing the math, it's like $800. Ugh. Friends, we often let these things, these murmurings, build and grow and fester be before they become this huge problem. That is Satan's goal in our lives. So how did the, how did the, the apostles respond? Verse 2. So the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and they said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. They're like, that's, uh, that's an interesting response. Imagine if I said that to you guys, ah, Adra is not for me, I'm here to preach. You guys do Adra. You guys would be like, this guy, who does he think he is? <laughs> and I always think that when I read this. And I think this is where some commentaries really helped me out. Because... When the disciples say it is not right, what they're really saying, it would not be right in the eyes of God for us to do this. And you might be asking, why would it not be right in the eyes of God to step out and help the, 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 the widows of the community? I'll tell you why. It's because they had a clear sense of calling. They had a clear sense of what they had been called to do what their responsibility and purpose in life was meant to be. And I think as I've gone through ministry, I'm realizing more and more that a clear calling can help you avoid so many situations. How many of you, not just me as a pastor, not just Josh as a pastor, God gives us all a calling. And when we have clarity of what we have been called to do, we can better say yes to things and we can better say no to things, right? I have trained to be a teacher and I could easily step into the classroom. One of our Adventist schools could call me up. We don't have enough teachers at school on Monday. Can you come teach the year eights? And I would say, no, that is not my calling. But so many of us say yes to every single thing that comes our way, and before we know it, we are inundated and we are drowning in yeses. Have you ever stopped to think of what God is calling you to do? See, here's the thing. This ministry to the widows, it's exactly that. In the Greek, we are told it was a ministry, a diakonos. It's where we get the word deacon from. A deacon is a person who ministers. And the first time we see this word is in this setting. There was a ministry of the word. There was a ministry of prayer. But there was also a ministry to the widows. This was an important work that needed to be done. But it needed to be done by somebody who had been called to that work. What have you been called to? In church, in your family, in your work setting, what have you been called to do? What have you been called to do? 
You know in your workplaces that there are jobs perhaps that only you can do and there are jobs that other people can do, but you cannot. Calling. What has God called you to do and how does that give you clarity in what you need to say yes to and what you need to say no to? It's my strong belief that so many people in the Western world today experience burnout because they have said yes to the wrong things and no to the wrong things. Pastors have this all the time. One of my very best of friends, I lived with him for several years, and we stay in touch from time to time. He works in another conference. It had been a few months, and I called him up like, how you been, man? He goes, I've been out of work for the last three months. Like, why? I had burnout hard. Like, what did that look like? Well, one day I literally just could not get out of my bed. My brain was going a million miles an hour, and I didn't know what to do, and I was paralyzed by fear. And I was like, I wish you had told me, because I didn't want to tell you. Friends, we go through these things, we take on so many yeses, and I'm not going to give you all his whole story, but don't we all do this? Here's our word to our mothers. What do you need to say yes to and what do you need to say no to? You guys are the unsung heroes of our family because you say yes to too much. What do you need to give to dad? My wife's going to have a long chat with me in the car. <laughs> but seriously, what do you need to go, I actually need you to start doing this more. What is it? What do you need to say no to? Maybe it's one of those extracurricular activities. Maybe the karate needs to go and we just have football, tennis, and swimming. What do you need to... You know, you know it's real, right? <laughs> what I love about the person of Jesus is that he had a clear sense of calling. At his final moments, he says this, John 17 verse 4, I have accomplished the work you have given me to do. Do you know that Jesus felt that he had completed the work he'd been called to do? Do you know how many people wanted him to heal him? Do you know how many cities in the Mediterranean he could have gone to? How did he say no? What stopped him from going to Egypt to helping the Egyptians out? What stopped him from heading north to Lebanon? A clear sense of calling. There were so many dead people to raise, so many hungry people to feed. He could have been doing it all, but Jesus knew the yeses to say yes to and the noes to say no to. What do you need to start saying yes and no to? We go to verse 3. Therefore, brothers, the, the disciples say, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit, and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Their sense of calling is clear. Can you see that? We are going to keep on doing the things we have been called to do, but we need to delegate roles out. Now, I just want to say this. This is a church, a really good church. So many people get involved. But like many churches, there are a lot of people who do a lot of the work and there's room to share a lot of the work that's being done. What could you be doing to help out? What do you need to be saying no to for some of us? The disciples had a clear sense of what their mission and purpose was and they realized that they needed to delegate this important ministry. This was an important task. And so they find some people to step into this role. They choose seven people. They choose Stephen and Philip, and they will become a focal point of the story. And we'll look at their stories. But they also, and Daniel, I felt for your brother, you were trying to pronounce some really hard names. Prochorus. Prochorus. What you have to do, Daniel, is you have to say it really fast like you know it. And even if you butcher it, everybody will think you know it. Just say Prochorus. They'll just believe you. They'll believe you. Prochorus. Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, that sounds like a chicken palmer, but we won't go there. <laughs> Nicolaus, 
what we see is all these guys were Greek. So there was a good solution. They picked people who would be good for the job, people who would care for the widows of the Jewish community. And there's this criteria which they go through, right? They're, they're, they're these people, and you can look at some of the qualifications in Paul's letters, but these weren't just any Tom, Dick, and Harry. These were good people, but they had a strong sense of calling to their community. These men may have even been the people who raised the complaint. And so what do we see, friends, from this very short story? Growth led to grumbling. But it took delegation to solve the problem. In our church, in your families, in your workplace, how could a clear sense of calling resolve some of the grumbling in your lives, in our lives? I haven't encountered grumbling here, thank God. <laughs> it's nice, but it's one of the worst issues that pastors have to deal with. But man, when it comes, it really comes hard. But what could you do? What is God calling you to do in this season of life with your family, with your church? I want you to see verse 7. This is some good news, verse 7. The disciples decide to tackle this head on, not to ignore it, not to let it just slip under the rug. But it says, and the word of God, as a result of the actions they took, continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. Imagine if they had just let this thing fester, but they deal with it, and now we see what? There's even more growth. The disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Man, we have a new class of people who are encountering God as a result of dealing with this issue head on. Friends, don't let the bruises get to you. Work them through. Figure them out. Don't. St I think I've told you this before. I stopped talking to my dad for two long years, and it ate me up. Don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to your church. Don't do that to your family. I want to invite our musicians up, our singers, to sing our final song. We're going to sing Fill My Cup, Lord. And as we sing it, I want you to reflect on the bruises of your life and what God is inviting you to work through. Thank you. Amen.